My name is Thomas G. McGee. I was born in Gaston, in North Carolina in 1922. Shortly after, my family moved to Belmont, North Carolina, and that is where I grew up until I was 19 years old. At that time, on December the 7th, World War II started and I enlisted in the Marine Corps for four years at Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. After entering the Marine Corps, I was sent to Paris Island, South Carolina, where after two to three weeks of training, we were interrupted at our training. I had not a fired a weapon, but the Marines, particularly the rifle range, the rifle firing. The Marines are, are real strong on carrying a rifle and being able to shoot. They took us out of Paris Island, put us aboard a troop train to Norfolk. This troop train, and I've never been to Norfolk before in my life. But this troop team fell into the North, pier at Norfolk under it. It was awesome to me. And here was this great large ship sitting there. And, and over on, there was about two train loads of Marines and two train loads of sailors. And we had heard all kind of rumors of where we were going and so-called Wake Island to help them at Wake Island and so forth in the Pacific, the Marine. But we loaded aboard this transport, and then in it, the transport we had a convoy. This convoy convicted, uh, consisted of one battle wagon, uh, I think it was two light cruisers, and a bunch of destroyers. And at times they took firing practice off the coast of North Carolina. We, they, they unloaded us in the Panama Canal Zone, both sailors and Marines. They had barracks there waiting on us, empty barracks that had been built. And we stayed there for two years and eight months. And they brought us back to the United States. I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And on December the in December, they transferred me to Quantico, Virginia, and I was discharged at Quantico December the 19th, 1945. I was discharged as a sergeant, buck sergeant at Quantico, and in 1946, I went in the Marine Corps Reserves and went to Camp June for a training, two-week training program, and they promoted me to staff sergeant. And on February the 9th, 1949, I was discharged from the Marine Corps to enter the, to enter, to enlist in the Army. Can yeah, tell us some more about that? Uh, I, I enlisted in the Army with my brother. Now the reason for this, my brother, could not get into the Marine Corps because of being colorblind. And he had been in Germany during World War II and he was a staff sergeant. So, and he was escorting war dead home from World War II and he talked me into going back into the service. Both of us really liked the military and the military had been pretty good to us. So we enlisted in the army, and I was trained. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. We went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Tell me what rank you were when you went to Fort Jackson. Just give, just hesitate. Go ahead, tell me that. Uh, when I went to Fort Jackson, I was a PFC, and my brother was a staff sergeant, and we immediately were shipped to California and then to Japan. 
Now, excuse me, were you both together all that time? Oh, yeah. Okay, so they didn't give you a sergeant rank right away? No. Oh, so you didn't get your Marine rank? No. Okay, tell us that. So you went to get, continue, you went to California, and tell us what unit you were in and what, what happened. Uh, we were just in the uh, holding company all the way because we had orders to, to report to the Far Eastern Command. And uh, they, they just processed us when the availability of a ship came. And uh, we went to Japan and was to, to, uh, to Yokohama, Japan, and went to a, an army base down there called, uh, at the base of Mount Fuji. And then they transferred us to to the 17th Infantry Regiment stationed at Sendai, Japan. Try not to rattle the paper because I can hear the paper and I want to hear you, not the paper. Okay, Tom? I want to know what? You, the paper was rattling. You're moving the paper. Okay. Okay. All right. Now tell us tell us what happened after that. Go ahead. I, I need to... You need to look at that? Go ahead. Take, I'll stop this a second. Go, look. Go ahead, Tom. I was assigned to as a company clerk for B Company, 17th Infantry. My brother was assigned as a tomb sergeant for, with C Company, both of us in the same battalion. And Charlie, and on the 12th, on 12-49, they sent me to Iwo Jima, Japan an island off the coast of Kerry where the first A bomb was dropped. Excuse me, Tom. Try not to read because you're looking down and I want to see you, right? you know, and when you're looking down, can you handle it without without reading? Can you do it without reading? No, I don't think so. Okay, well do the best you can if you have to make reference. Go ahead. But once you once you look down, then look up and talk, okay? Rather than talking while you're reading. But anyway, when I went back, reported back to my unit, Company B, they promoted me to corporal. And that at that time, my brother and I had gotten enough in Japan and we had decided to put in for officer's training school in the United States. And, and both of us submitting at the same time, the, the clerk that was doing the submitting put mine, he thought my application was a duplicate of Paul's. So, so all of a sudden Paul gets ordered to report back to Fort Riley, Kansas for officer's training camp, officer's training school. And I stayed at that time, uh, the S-2 sergeant, and we call him intelligence sergeant, was transferred, was getting ready to go back to the United States. So the, the S-2 officer, Captain, Walls made a survey of all the, he checked all the records of the people in the 17th Infantry Regiment, and he picked me, a lowly corporal, to take over that position. And I became S, S2 sergeant. And the, and that, in our duties there were, my duties there were, we uh, we were working, trying to get a good read on the Chinese Communist, uh, the North Korean Army, and uh, the Russian Army of battle, uh, the, their battle order of battle, and uh, we worked on that very closely for as long as, I was up, as long as we were in Japan. We had a good read on it. We, uh, we got in, we got an intelligence report from General Headquarters in Tokyo every month. We 
by interrogating the prisoners, the CIA say interrogated the prisoner. Hold on one second, I'm gonna stop you. Tell me these were Japanese prisoners. The reason we were interrogating the Japanese prisoners, they were captives of the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans during World War II. And they were being returned to Japan and we would pick them up at the port of entry in our area were the ones coming to our area. And uh, the CIC would inter inter interrogate them and we found out we even had we even had some battalion commander's name, uh, generals, uh, who the, what weapons they had. Uh, did they have no of any intent of, of uh, fighting? So let me stop you again. So at that time, was it, was there suspicions that there was going to be a war in Korea? Exactly. Okay. Well, tell us about that. Say that. Uh, Go ahead. We we had uh, the division that I was in, the Seventh Infantry Division, was uh, was pulled out of Korea and sent sent to Japan to be in the Army of Occupation of Japan at the end of the war, World War II. And we had a, we had a whole state that we were responsible for. They called them prefectures of where I believe. So we had a good read on, on uh, what they were up to. We knew, uh, the, we knew that about all the North Korean army was right up against the border of South Korea, and they were, weren't there for the fun of it, they were there to do something. And henceforth, we began extensive training to send out from uh, the 8th Army. We weren't doing all, we were training more heavily and trying to get in shape. All our weapons had came from the 101st Airborne Division, who occupied that this area we in before we got there. The 17th Infantry was should have had three battalions. We had two battalions. We had no tank company, no engineering support. No air support, nothing. We were just had what was left over by the 101st Airborne, and all of it was worn out. Uh, weapons wouldn't fire. Ammunition with the army had un underestimated the uh, need for artillery ammunition, and had destroyed so much of it that when we got to Korea, we, we were short on artillery ammunition. We had no winter clothes. We, we had about, I think about a six weeks of uh, training before we, for by that time there was only one division left in Japan and that was the seventh division. And all of us were in poor shape physically. Uh, Tell us about the Koreans that were attached to your unit. Tell us about that. Uh, Go ahead. At, well, after we got we got a a uh, as well as I can can remember, they sent a uh, quite a few of the Korean Army officers to Sendai to learn be trained by our people. One man in particular was a colonel called Kim, and uh, apparently he decided that he liked me and I liked him, and I entertained him and kept him going while I was over. I don't think he did too much training. And it was, uh, we went, when we, they pulled all the other outfits out, uh, division, infantry, Combat outfits out of Korea. We were left there by ourselves. So uh, the seventh, even the thirty-second, and the 
31st. Moved out before we did. Okay, tell us about how the war broke. Where, where you were when the war broke out and how you found out about it. Yeah. Well, of course we, uh, we got, we were right on, they sent us a, uh, I had been cleared for top secret and secret information and uh, they would send, they sent us a, uh, expectation, I think, at one time that we could expect to that some, a war would probably break out in Korea, and uh, they we certainly weren't prepared for it, but we had no choice. Okay, now tell us when the war broke out. What happened? What, what happened? What, what happened the seventeenth? Tell us about that. When the war broke out, uh, we started doing, we started training uh, quite a bit. They, we even, we even went to the rifle range to qualify for the, uh, qualify, uh, requalify on the rifle range. Uh, we, we were in IG inspection all over to see if we were prepared to go. And we were not prepared, but they qualified us anyway. And then they moved us down to Cayucia, right, right across right across sea from uh, Korea. And uh, we Stay down there a while, and then move us back to Yokohama to uh, uh, I'm going to stop in a second. They they transferred us up from Kaioshi to Camp Zama, right at the base of uh, Mount Fuji and there we were there we went into some extensive training and received something like 150 or more South Korean soldiers to be in, in, integrated into our unit. And one several day, several weeks later, we were ordered to Yokohama, and went aboard a troop transport. Uh, our regiment troop transports. Anyway, the, we it, and we, we we went all night. And we went anchored in the the harbor at Incheon. And then we got the orders of, I believe it called Gold Rush, anyway, the order for the breakout of Pusan perimeter and the attack on the engine. From the, from, uh, we so stayed. Just, just a moment now. So now when you land at Incheon, you're behind the enemy lines, right? No, the, no. The, weren't, weren't, weren't the North Koreans down? Uh, have that perimeter around uh, Pusan? The, the perimeter included well, Incheon. Oh, included Incheon, okay. Oh, they didn't have it. Okay. There wasn't no way they could take Incheon because they didn't have the boat equipment. Okay, go ahead. Continue. Sorry. And well, we got the top secret orders from General Headquarters in Tokyo, and so we proceeded to Incheon and anchored in the, cha in the flats of Incheon Harbor. And uh, at that time, uh, the Marines, uh, the 31st Infantry, I believe it was, and the 2nd Battalion, of 2nd Battalion of our regiment were Attack had already taken Incheon and were, all, were attacking Seoul. So they unloaded us 
at Anchon from the LSC, L, LST, and as we we went right by the U.S. Missouri, who was sitting there firing its 16-inch guns on. No, excuse me. Were you being fired upon at all during that landing? No, no. no. So the, the U.S. the Army had control of that area. Oh yeah, we'd okay. already rank, okay. we'd taken in, John. Yes. Okay. And we had, they were they were getting ready to take uh, Seoul. And. Uh, Anyway, the Missouri was firing on Enchon, and we went right by it and landed at Enchon. Enchon was pretty well devastated. It just, uh, I don't remember seeing any large buildings at all. It was standing. It was flattened. Okay. Uh, Tom? When we landed at Enchon, our division commander was General Barr. A major, a major general from World War II, and uh, Colonel Powell, Herbert B. Powell, also a, vet, a veteran of World War II. We had a lot of officers in NCOs that were veterans of World War II. But what you didn't tell me was Colonel Powell was the 17th Regimental Commander. Give me that in a sentence. Colonel Powell was, Colonel Powell, was the regimental camp commander for the 17th Infantry. Well, starting from... Tell me something about Colonel Powell and Colonel Quinn. Compare the two of them. Uh, I've served under... In Korea, I served under Colonel... Powell, then Colonel Quinn, and then Colonel McGowan. Three, uh, three, I served under the three regimental commanders in Korea. And I also served under four. Tell me about them. Uh, in, in Korea, I served under Colonel Powell. Colonel Quinn and Colonel McGowan. McGowan I served with for a short time and I was there for all the time that Colonel Quinn commanded the regiment and all the time that Colonel Powell commanded the regiment. Uh, our, we had a, our general of the 7th Division was General Barr. General Barr was an old-time World War II officer, and so was Colonel Quinn and Colonel Powell. Uh, the one, the two that I was best acquainted with, I was right at that, right with them almost all the time. Uh, they uh, they depended on me to keep do my job and talk to them you know, all the time, going and coming, about what we were doing, this sort of thing. Colonel Powell, in my estimation, was the best commander that I had in Korea. Colonel Quinn was second, and I did not know enough about McGowan to say it talked about him too much. I did, he wasn't there long. I wasn't there long enough for him. Colonel Powell was stuck strictly to, to the way things should be run at what he was taught at West Point in, in World War II. He was a fire commander. He, he did his job well. He was good to the troops. He was always up there when they were fighting. He was always up there with them. When, when a fight was going on, we were in a battle, he was with the troops. He was a good man. And he later retired as a full general.
commander of the Continental Army of the United States of America. Colonel, Colonel Quinn reminded me an awful lot of that. He was a show colonel. He, uh, he come up with the Buffalo thing. He, he operated under and reported almost directly to the 10th Corps commander, General Alvin, who was a MacArthur substitute. He, uh, he was looking for glory instead of, in my, a lot of times I don't think he used good judgment. For instance, one time uh, we were in reserve and he, he believed in having one battalion between us and the fight that was going on. Uh, that battalion would be fight. And uh, in reserve also, uh, he, he, we were up there, in my estimation, we were always too close. And of course, a smart enemy knows what you're doing. And one night, uh, one night we were in reserve. We, we had lined up like we was on the parade ground at West Point. Uh, Iron Arbortoon. Uh, that night, uh, that night the we had a USO, that day we had a USO show, had a large number of troops there from the regiment watching this USO show. We, uh, we were, they, they, they brought us up a bunch of beer and booze and cigarettes that we hadn't had in any supply of mouth or anything in a long time. Um, a lot of the troops were drinking very heavy, but I was not one of them. I, had no be I knew better. I knew that Major Walls had briefed me on time and time again on what to do and how to hold but one thing he always says is don't be under the influence of the alcohol any time that you're in your the combat unit. And it, so in my 11 months in Korea, for some reason that day, uh, we were at the base of this mountain and the old rice paddies down there and we were we were camped at the, in the rice paddy in pup tents, and uh, the, I dug a foxhole that day by myself. My buddy, he was he was uh, drinking pretty heavy, and so he didn't help me. But I dug a dig. It, it was easy digging in that place where I, the rice paddy had been. One and only time in all my time over there that that I dug a fox up. Nobody ever told me to or not to. <laughs> we were on the move all the time, didn't have time to dig them, really. And about 10 o'clock that night, well, first of all, we had a, we had the S3 sergeant, Sergeant Merle, took our well, they gave us a uh, six pack of beer and we took it up to the reservoir and put put it down in the reservoir and got it cold, almost as cold as you could get it in a ice block. And again, uh, I was able to buy a fifth of a Canadian club and, start, and they get, sold me carton of cigarettes, which I didn't smoke cigarettes, I didn't smoke at all. Uh, Sergeant Merrill wanted them worse than I did, and he gave me some, a good amount of money for both of them. 
and he always did that. Uh, but anyway, come 10 o'clock, I was in my park and my sleeper, uh, my sleeping bag in the tent, had my rifle in there, my ammunition and my helmet with me. And this, this young kid that was with me, supposed to be with me, he came in and he was fully loaded. And he stretched out. I, we both went to sleep. And then I woke up, I uh, heard artillery rounds coming in, whistling coming in. And I think it was our, our first battalion that they were hit first. And they worked right down through the, through the rest of us. Anyway, uh, the, the Colonel Quinn and my, my foxhole was pretty close to his. And uh, he was just, he was just, when he had gotten uh, about, I imagine a six inch, 12 inches or so into the ground or somebody had for him and didn't go no further. Anyway, the, the artillery started hitting real close up on this mountain, throwing hot steel down there on us. Some of it cut through the pup tents that we were sleeping in. Some people were killed, some people were hurt. Uh, and they just kept walking down, they hit, to my best of my remember, they hit tank company, they hit their mess hall, hit tank company, the medic, they hit the medics, these medical people were sleeping in their ambulances and a lot of them got hurt. I don't know what the capture rate was, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty high, considering we were supposed to have been in reserve. So, I think that was a terrible mistake. Now, what do you think the mistake was, that being in reserve so close to the alarm yeah. battalion? Yeah, yeah. Do you mean that like that? They, uh, we were so close, uh, and this, whoever was firing us, that artillery back there, they knew exactly where we were, had to. So they must, they must have sent somebody down in there while we were all having a good time and checked our positions out. Now, did it, at any time while you were there in Korea, did you ever hear the trumpets and the loudspeakers? No. You never, you never heard that. No, no, no. Never this, close enough to that. This thing. was this artillery fire. Okay. Uh, was. In fact, the 31st Infantry, I think, was in front of the 1st Battalion fighting them. You could hear that going on, but not loud, you know, this, but you knew it was going on. Well, can you recall, do you remember, did you see what Colonel Quinn did that night? Did you see him that night? Oh, yeah, he got so, up. Can't tell, me, tell me about that. Uh, anyway, Colonel Quinn, I got up, got down in my foxhole, I took my rifle, put my rifle, put my cartridge belt on, my rifle belt on, um, took my rifle, my helmet, put that on, pull, pull my, my friend down in there, put him in the box, bottom of the box hole, and I got up and I went over to my, to the S2 section where the telephone was and we were trying to get Anyway, the colonel came in and, and he was using the S3 phone, I think, and we were trying to get our artillery to fire counter battery. And they couldn't fire counter battery because they wanted to fire themselves and they had not dug the artillery. They had no, inf no, no, nothing. They didn't have nowhere to shoot to start with. So they couldn't do anything, and, uh, but it lasted all night. The whole it was a terrible, terrible situation. Do you, do you remember how many casualties there were? Uh, 
Do you have any idea? Uh, I, I know I heard something like seven or nine. I don't know. I don't, I'm not too sure of that. Okay. Um, can you tell me something about, you were there during the winter, right? Yes. Tell us something about the Korean winters, what you remember about the Korean winters. Well, the, uh, the uh, winter, the winter that I was there was the 50 winter. Uh, we, it was, we were doing all right. We didn't have any winter clothes, of course. I wasn't, we didn't have anything. And uh, they finally issued us uh, some kind of a coat, light winter coat, that hung down about to the knees. Of course, I got that if you want to say it. Uh, How about the Mickey Mouse boots? Did they issue yeah. Mickey Mouse? You want to tell us about that? What? The Mickey Mouse boots, did you get issued them? No, we did, We still had a, the regular boots. We never did get any special boots that I remember. Uh, the winter was so cold. Uh, uh, we started out, we landed at Ingwon and that wasn't too bad there, but as we closer we got to Asan Jin, uh, you come up on one plateau and it's not too bad, and if, then you get a higher plateau and uh, man, you're on the north, uh, the Manchurian Plain then, and it was some more close. It was uh, it was over 30 degrees cold. Thanksgiving Day there. And, uh, I know that some nights it got down to 50. Now when you say 50, 50 below zero? Yes. Tell me about that because you didn't tell it that way. Well, the, it got so cold that we had to use, uh, we had to keep our vehicles running 10 minutes on the hour. hour. We had to have sensors had to keep those vehicles running because they were, you know, we couldn't move without them. And that's the only way we could do it. We didn't have any. We just had wood alcohol, I believe they call it, to, to cool them with, and that was not a proper winter cooling. Can you tell us about the march to the Yellow River? Tell us about going up to the Yellow River now. Well, going up to the Yellow River, uh, we, uh, we basically were fighting North Koreans all the way. Uh, they they did not have the facilities to compete with us. Uh, the, their their manpower was about shot. We were running into uh, basically the National Guard units, and we ran into when we took uh, Capsan. Uh, we ran into the. Uh, just boys in the trenches there, caps on. They were the last, last big fight we had before getting to Haysan Jin. Uh, they didn't have a proper ammunition. We, for instance, we were, we were firing, firing our artillery, firing on punks on, and and. Uh, the rest of us were just waiting there, punk, waiting there where the artillery was, and here come this old lady. She looked like she must have been a hundred years old. Just kind of sifting down the road, and of course the GIs was making fun of her and all that. But the next day. Next day, we when we retook when we took the position that they were fending up there, she was in the trenches with these troops, and had been they had sent her down there somewhere to get some ammunition. She walked right through us down there and got the ammunition and went back. And they were using it against us the next day, but we uh, took that position, uh, and that was our last stand before we got to. To Haysan, Jim. Okay. Now tell us what you could see when you got to the Yellow River. Did you realize you were at the Manchurian War? Well, you asked too. You would know that, right? 
Oh, yeah. You knew where you were. Oh, yeah. I had okay. Forever. Tell us about that, what it was like when you got to the river. Well, the the thing about it, uh, it, it was so cold and miserable. Uh, snow was on the ground, of course. Uh, the, the, all the, you know, all the towns that we took, of course, were put under at times we used uh, B-29s dropping bombs on them and they were in bad. Some of them were just blown to pieces. Uh, we had air, aircraft attacking these towns and everything else. And it looked, it was just terrible. There was uh, towns that, would, that, would, that you would think there'd be people in there would be nobody there. Then very few people in any of the ones we took. They, of course, were going back with the troops North Korean troops, and uh, we could look out. Uh, we had an outpost way up on a mountain overlooking the China. They could look out over the Yellow River, uh, and uh, we could look out over that. And uh, one day. While we were there, uh, one of the MiGs came flying down, waved at us as he went by, <laughs> and let us know that he he knew we were up there. But that was the only aircraft I saw we saw during all that time that I saw. No, <clears throat> no. When you went to Yellow, was there any talk about crossing the Yellow into Manchuria? Uh, no. All the talk then was by. Uh, the king himself, that we would be home for Christmas, back in Japan for Christmas. When you say the king, tell me who you mean by the king. The king MacArthur. And at that time, he, tell me that in a, in, a, well, in a couple of sentences. What did you hear? Okay, so give me that again. Well, we had gotten word that, uh, I don't know whether it came with a grapevine, but I think it came from Tokyo myself, that most of us would be pulled out and be back in Japan by Christmas. And we were looking forward to that. And of course that didn't happen. Well what happened after that? They came you how long were you at the Yellow River? How long were you up there? Uh and give me that again in a sentence without that it just answered me. We were up there we had Thanksgiving Day dinner. We were up there about I imagine. I imagine probably a week or so. I'm not, I can find. I, it's okay. It's all right. It's about, you're right. About a week or so. Now, what did you get orders to move south then? Tell us about that. Uh, then uh, we, of course, uh, started getting orders from uh, uh, General Alvin to attack at that time back towards the west along the Yellow River, which we did what the best we could, but we weren't making a whole lot of progress when uh, we were told to pack up and get back to Hung now as best as we could. Did you see the Chinese at that point? Uh, no, no, I did not. You, not, you were Oh, about, oh yes, I saw. Tell us about that. Uh, we could send our we could stand there on the Yellow River and see them over there in this little old town across the river, the Chinese soldiers and civilians. Not many, but they were over there. We could walk and see them. Well, did you know about the battle that was going on at the Chosen Reservoir? Oh, yes, we knew that. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, we, uh, we got word that uh, our 30, 32nd, Regiment and uh, 31st was involved with the 1st Marine Division down there at, at the uh, Chosen Reservoir, and that they were up against thousands and thousands of Chinese that were giving, you know, forced them to withdraw. And uh, my understanding was that the, I believe it was the 31st Infantry lost. Probably over 
75 percent of their their strength in that while they were in that they were trapped and surrounded and time and time again. Now, the unit, your unit didn't make contact with them during that time. Uh, we, uh, we, as far as I know, as far as I can remember, we didn't have any contact with the with the Chinese until we our second trip up north through the heartland of South Korea, North Korea. How far back did you go, and when you were moving south? You did, go, did you go all the way back to Seoul? No. No, we went all. Well, when we withdrew, we withdrew to Hungnam, Korea. Uh, while uh, while we were there, we uh, we were in a, we put, uh, we were put in a perimeter defense around this Hungnam and Hung Hungham, two cities there. And uh, I think it was maybe the second night or the third night we were there. We they attacked us. North Korean some North Korean soldiers attacked us and penetrated our lines. And we counterattacked, drove them back, and captured 19 prisoners. And those prisoners uh, were brought back to, we had a Korean, Korean company with us that provided CP security for us, stayed with us all the time through all this. They uh, turned those prisoners over to them. We'll stop you, the tape is at an end. They, we were given orders to pack up and leave. Excuse me, put the paper down. You don't need that now, because that's just making noise. Uh, again, start again, start again, Tom. We were told to pack up and we would be leaving. And uh, this Puerto Rican regiment, I think it was the 4th Infantry Division. The 4th Infantry Division had enclosed into the same defense that we were in. Were in. They, they had come up from uh, the southeast, southwest. And uh, the Marines, of course, were evacuated first. Uh, they, but I'm a, this uh, captain, Korean captain, called me and told me he wanted to see me and that had the prisoner. So I went down there to see him. He said, what do you want me to do with these prisoners? I said, well, what do you mean want to do with them? I said, we're going to take them back with us. He said, we can kill them, it'd be a lot easier to kill them. And believe me, he'd been happy to kill them. Just walked out there and shot them, and no problem at all. And I said, no, don't do that. So anyway, I went back, and all of a sudden, we were I was ordered to get, get out of there. And uh, that this thing has bothered me all my life. Uh, well, what bothered you? Tell me what bothered you. Well, what bothered me was that uh, I don't know what ever happened to prisoners. The prisoners, when we got back to got back got out of that trap, uh, I never did find out what. Was, I never did look. Well, I probably could have, but I just didn't pu push it any further. I told my boss about it, but I didn't push it any further. What do you think happened to them? I think they probably were killed. That's my guess, but uh, the it was it was really my responsibility because I wasn't. Not, but I, we did do some supervision over this Korean unit. Now, did you do any interrogation of those prisoners? Uh, not these, no. Okay. 
But in uh, with this, uh, we were in constant movement. Well, we, all we were interested in at that time was just holding that, put, that uh, defending ourselves there at, the, at that perimeter where we were holding. He, uh, now I'd like to go back and about the incident coming down, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Hayson Gym. When we left Hayson Gym, the 17th RCT, as far as I know, we only lost one one person. I don't, I'm not sure of this, but I was told we lost one person and one jeep run off the side of the mountain and kill himself drunk. That's what I, they told us. It used this alcohol we used in the jeeps. And as we were going down to the mountain, we had these covers with air flaps that you, you could put over your ears. And uh, Sergeant Murray Yama of the I and R platoon, a brave young Japanese Nisi who served the United States well in Korea. Uh, he was riding in the back in the Jeep with me and my driver. And we we were coming down and we had a break that come down to a, a level. And we had a break, and the engineers, combat engineers, uh, 13th Combat uh, Battalion of engineers were burning all uh, bridging equipment. I had a big mountainous fire down there, and we stopped to get warm. And. Uh, but before we stopped, I, 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 had, I looked back and I saw he had his, he had his ear muffs tied up on top of his head. I said, Sergeant, you better put them things down there. It's cold. Oh, he said, we're well, down here where it's not cold now. I'm, not, I'm all right. So I'm standing there beside him with my hands up like that. I looked over there and both of his ears had popped up about a half inch high, frostbitten. I said, Lordy mercy, Mary Comey, we're going to get you. So all you could do was uh, the frostbite, frostbitten people over there was uh, sometimes we'd lose the regiment, lose 10 or 12 at a time at night and some of the real cold weather. All you could do was send them back to the rear, and most of them, I think, they sent them over to the hospital in Tokyo. But that sergeant got that another thing. I never did hear see him after that or hear from him. Yeah, I think he got evacuated though. Okay, tell us about your promotions. You just, we were talking about it at lunch. Tell me about how you got your promotions. Well, I. I was, uh, when I was, uh, I really, uh, I, the Major told me that, I, that the reason he selected me for the S2 that I, that I had the highest IQ in the regiment. I don't know how true that was, but that's what he told me. And uh, anyway, I was a, at that time I was a company clerk Corporal, when I went over there to the headquarters, and of course my the the other other sergeants doing jobs like I had, like S1, S3, and S4, were all master sergeants. And here I was, just uh, they pro they promoted they had promoted me to buck sergeant in the in uh, Japan. And the reason that happened, uh, we were having we were having a parade for General Walker, commander of the Eighth Army, and a bunch of generals. Uh, and he 
they came up to Sendai, and we put the parade. We're putting on the parade. Of course, I was right there with them. And all of a sudden, uh, got a sound. They had a loudspeaker up there. That said, Sergeant McGee, report to your station immediately on the double. Kept saying that, you know, we're a whole 17th after. And I took off, and uh, here I was, because only two of us had, had the key to the big, huge safe that we had over there to walk in and drive a truck in, really. Had to, could open that safe. One of me was I was out there on the field, and so was, so was uh, my captain. And uh, I went over there and opened it up for them. But so they got these other people seemed then got I got their attention. And as I went along, I can't remember, but it seemed like about every 30 days or so they gave me a promotion till I was a master sergeant. Now, there's one last thing I'm going to ask you about. You told me about your brother being in the military and in Korea at the same time as you. Do you have a story about how you met, how you met up in Korea? Yes. Tell us, tell us about that. Try and make it not too long, but try and just tell us something about that. Uh, Tell us what your brother was doing, what his rank was. And, and my brother, my brother had was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. He was an instructor in the, the Ranger in the jump school down there. Had a frozen MOS, which meant he wasn't supposed to go. And he went to his commander and said he just couldn't do his job, knowing that his brother was trapped in uh, over there that they hung down the perimeter. And so the captain said, okay, you can go. He authorized him. And so my brother uh, was a staff sergeant, a sergeant first class at that time. And lo and behold, they found, he found out he was a, he had a lieutenant's commission as a, uh, in the Army Reserve. So he came over there, and he he wanted to be of the help to the ones that was hurt the most, which it was the Second Infantry Division. They had lost very, very, very. They had lost many, 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 many men in uh, their retreat from uh, Wanju and up in that area. So he volunteered to go to that division. He was assigned to the 2nd platoon, 2nd battalion, uh, G Company, 2nd battalion, 23rd Reg Park Regiment, Regiment. And I did not know one thing about it. And one, I was, I was a, uh, Right in my jeep, and I saw that this boy, a soldier from Baker Company, who knew me in Japan, and uh, he said, "Tom, I saw your brother over teaching Chichun." I said, "Come off of that." He said, "He's over there with the with the 23rd." Well, I knew the 23rd was tied in with us, and I knew where they were, so I got in my Jeep, and we went over there, and I said, what in the devil are you doing over here? You are crazy. He said, well, I couldn't let you, I couldn't let you fight this war by yourself, so I saw him that time, I saw him two more times after that. I said, we were both usually in the same corps, our, our 7th Division, his 2nd Division. Uh, we were usually tied in with them in most cases. 
we also served, our division was transferred into the Ninth Corps at one time. That's great. I think I got all I need, okay, Tom? I'll let you go now. That's really good. Thank you.